So we're going to start with, as I said, uh, the Lessie music video. Uh, the song was written by Lessie and myself. It's performed by Lessie. It's on the Lessie of Bridging Heaven and Earth CD. All the same love.
Hi, everybody. We're here with Daniel. Welcome. Oh, thanks very much. It's exciting to be here. Good. So why don't you talk a little bit about how you were going along in your life and all of a sudden you get this patch where, like, you know, you're a walking <laughs> ghost. You know, the streets you walked your whole life and everything was yeah. fine. Well, basically that is a sort of, you know, a, a, in a slow motion way, I just entered this crisis and I'd been writing for magazines and editing and, you know, trying to write fiction. I edited this literary magazine and published it with some friends and, you know, it was very much part of like the New York art and literary world, and media world. And I just really began to realize that I wasn't interested in even the goals that I could possibly achieve if I became, you know, the New York Times lead magazine writer or something. I just didn't even care. And I began to just, you know, I was just in an existential crisis. And I, and I said to myself, like, you know, I have to know, is there anything else beyond the kind of material, pa materialist paradigm, which is the basic kind of uh, paradigm in New York, you know, this kind of ambition, you know, you, you want to get ahead, you want to be... Fame, fortune, yeah, exactly. oh, the regular and, American you know, dream. And since I didn't, you know, both my parents were artists and writers, but they weren't um, spiritual in any, in any sense beyond that. So I didn't really have a, a tradition to beam into. But I remembered that when I was in college, I'd had psychedelic experiences that had been very important to me. And um, I think I'd always thought that at some point I would go back and explore that again. And so, you know, I, I just remembered that there'd been this opening to other realms and um, sometimes scary experiences, sometimes like profound experiences, a sense of kind of a peeling away of one's personality. Um, so I decided I would very systematically go back and explore that. So I began to read about it and I discovered that, you know, since, even since then, which I guess I was in college in the early 80s, there had been a huge explosion of information about psychedelics on a very underground, quiet way. You know, it hadn't really, you know, nobody I knew was talking about it. You know, there was um, Terence McKenna's works and Sasser Shulgin's works and, uh, you know, this book by Jeremy Narby called The Cosmic Serpent. And there were all these substances that I'd never heard of before, uh, like ayahuasca and, um, uh, you know, iboga, which is ibogaine, which is this African substance. So first I wrote a piece for The Voice about ayahuasca. And even though ayahuasca is not exactly real, it's kind of like an underground um, uh, thing. But I went through it to a ritual in New York, and I wrote about that for The Village Voice. And then I got an assignment. What do you mean by not being real? I mean, it is from a, a root, right? Oh. Uh, what do you mean not real? I, I just wasn't clear. Real? No, it's totally, it's, it's completely real. Ayahuasca is actually a brewed together from two plants, and it's the sacred substance of the Amazon basin. Uh, sometimes it has different admixture plants added to it. One is the ayahuasca vine, and the other is a plant that contains DMT, which is a very powerful psychedelic, and they kind of work chemically together. Um, no, I meant that, it, I was talking about the, the, the legality of it. Which oh, is sort of oh. like, you know, I don't think anybody has really been arrested in the U.S. for ayahuasca, but because it contains DMT, it's kind of borderline. Uh, and there's some interesting legal cases going on now about ayahuasca's uh, status. But anyway, so I took ayahuasca in the ceremony. It was interesting, unconvincing. I also went back and re-experimented with mushrooms and LSD, which was also very interesting. Then I got an assignment from a music magazine, Vibe, to actually go to Africa to go to Gabon, which is right on the equator, and go through a tribal initiation ritual taking Iboga. And, um, you know, I decided I would, I would do this. Um, I, there was and this was lining up, I mean, synchronistically. That, Correct. I mean, it was amazing exactly. to you that you decide you had to explore this and then you get this assignment. Yeah, I mean, I pitched the story to them, right. but, you know, I never would have imagined that they would have actually sent me to Africa, but they got all enthusiastic. So, um, so I had this opportunity to go th to try and experience the African spirit realm, you know. Um, and I found a botanist who'd been working with the uh, Bwiti, which is the tribe down there, and he'd been uh, studying the plant and, and the rituals and, uh, you know, how, the, how the, the meaning of the plant and the culture. So I went down to Gabon and I met him and we went into the jungle and uh, had this, you know, very complicated experience because, you know, there was a lot of sort of cultural stuff we hadn't really worked out. The shaman um, got very greedy at a certain point and started demanding more money from us before the ceremony and then yelling at us. But it was really, you know, it was just, it, we didn't, you know, we didn't have a very brilliant cultural negotiation going on. But yet the actual experience of taking Iboga was tremendous. Um, it's a very long acting substance. It lasts for about somewhere between 20 and 30 hours. It has different phases. 
it was also very clear how incredibly knowledgeable, how sophisticated the um, Bwiti were about iboga and how to use it. They have music which is synced to the whole ritual. They play different kinds of music throughout the night as you pass through these different phases. Uh, in the beginning they have you sit in front of a mirror as the visionary phase starts. Then later on you lie down and then you have a phase which is intensely psychoanalytic. I mean a lot of people who take iboga have described it as 10 years of psychoanalysis in a single night. And I would have to say that there's some truth to that because for me I went through, and that for me was the most intense part of the experience. I mean I didn't have an incredible visionary trip but I had this amazing period of um, uh, early childhood memories coming up and really the kind of feeling, it was like, it was like being you know, back in the kind of feeling realm of being a little child and you know, the kind of uh, you know, the feeling of your parents fighting and what that means to you and you know, the, the fear of something mysterious under your bed. Um, and I really had a sense going back through my life up to that point of how I'd been sort of constructed as a person and um, that there was a lot of depression and, and despair and, and bad stuff but also a lot of very fabulous stuff that I gained from that and that somehow where I'd arrived having had this experience I had a kind of feeling of liberation that I had a real freedom to you know reconceive myself and go on and, and do something else so ultimately it ended up being a very very important experience to me on many levels it also really began to change my dream life after a while um, in what way um, I just it just opened me more to the to the dream world and um, I w we actually did two ceremonies because we wanted to get away from the greedy shaman so we went and visited this other tribe afterwards and we had another all-night ceremony and there one of the shamans of that tribe looked at me at a certain point and I actually hadn't really taken any iboga. I mean, he'd been eating uh, a little bit during the night. And he said that he saw my uh, mother's mother hovering over me um, as I sat by the fire. And she, he could see that um, she, she loved me very much, but that uh, she died recently, and she was sort of holding me back from vi visiting the spirit realm. And that was why I hadn't had the visions that I was supposed to have. And what was quite amazing about this was that this guy didn't know me at all. and not only was my, had my mother's mother died recently, she died about two years ago, she was also the only grandparent that I ever knew because all of the other ones had died before I was born. So if he was just guessing, I can't imagine how he would have seen this. I still don't really know how he saw it. A few months after this experience, uh, I came back to New York and I had this very vivid dream where my grandmother was in my house and she was kind of like um, going through all of my uh, possessions, looking through my drawers and you know, I, I called her on the phone and I was like, you know, Grandma, just get out of my house. I don't want you there anymore. Just go and watch television. Go do something. And uh, she kind of, you know, crept off and disappeared. And when I woke up from that dream, it was like that. I just, real, I just felt that this had been a real experience, that she had, was a spirit. She'd been lingering on. And um, I somehow through the iboga, I'd gained more awareness and more kind of spiritual force. Right? I could just be like, Psh, you know, um, and of course, I, even at that point, I didn't take this totally seriously. I just kind of wrote it down and molded it over. But over time, I began to have more and more experiences like this that slowly began to convince me that, that there was something else going on with the dream world where you actually are in contact with spirits and, and you know, spirits of the dead and, and all sorts of stuff. And so, and so where did you go from there? You wrote this article. You'd been to Africa. And, and still, you had that hunger to yeah. know. Well, I got I mean, once again, it was synchronistic synchronistic good fortune. I had a fellowship at Columbia University for a year uh, an art, from this program called the Arts Journalism Program. And that turned out to be a really amazing year for me because I worked with different anthropologists there, especially um, Michael Tausig, who wrote a book called Shamanism, Colonialism, and the Wild Man. And he really, um, you know, I went deep into the whole subject with him. And also he was very interested in Walter Benjamin, who was this German uh, Jewish philosopher, died in 1940. And um, Walter Benjamin became very important to the book, um, just as his thinking about intoxication and what he called profane illumination. Um, Walter Benjamin also had experimented with hashish and with uh, mescaline. Um, so that really gave me a year to kind of uh, focus on the whole intellectual kind of underpinnings of the book. And um, at the end of the year, I wrote the proposal, sold the proposal, and then had the, you know, um, ability to go on and, and keep uh, exploring. So I went to Africa, uh, excuse me, I went to the Amazon. I visited a tribe in the Ecuadorian Amazon, worked with some shaman, the shamans there and took ayahuasca. 
um, in, in the real ceremony, you know, in, in, the, in the tribal situation. And that was also a tremendous experience. <coughs> they also went to Mexico, uh, visited a shaman in uh, Oaxaca. And how do you locate these shaman? I mean, you know, is there like a yellow pages or is it just? Well, the internet is an amazing yellow pages for all sorts of things, right. you know. And, um, you know, there, there, were, there would be different, I mean, as I began to investigate, you know, different trips would come up. Because I know we've had there. guests on the show who've, you know, yeah. lead tours to, you know, yeah. ayahuasca journeys and different kinds of journeys. And have written books about it, about their, you know, teachers and shaman. Right. Like I that. mean, the Mexico one was kind of funny because we just went, I went with my girlfriend, we went to, Huatla de Jimenez, which is actually, you know, has an amazing place in psychedelic lore because it's where uh, Gordon Wasson found Maria Sabina and had the first mushroom trip that introduced mushroom uh, psilocybin to the modern West. We wrote about it for Life magazine. So we went back there, didn't know anybody, and went up to Maria Sabina's house. And on the way, we met the, her, one of her grandsons and found out, it turned, turned out her son is a practicing shaman. So we had a ritual with him. Um, that was really nice, yeah. So I just feel like, yeah, I mean, it was very synchronistic, like one thing followed on another, and I just, I just began to feel like I was soaking up all of this incredible information, and also that I was coming at it with this kind of philosophical um, underpinnings of the Walter Benjamin and, and uh, all this kind of stuff I'd been thinking about. You know, I think it gave the book uh, a lot of breadth and a lot of depth at the same time. Yeah. And, and what what was like the evolution in your in your experience in your thinking? Mm -hmm. You know, as you move through these paths. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean how did you go from this guy who was a walking ghost, and what you know, what was the opening, the closing, mm -hmm. the the flowering? Yeah, in your it, life? it was just step by step and a constant reality testing. You know, I, I would you know something would. You know, I'd have an experience, visionary experience, dream experiences. Dreams became became more and more important to me, and then I would just, you know, keep mulling it over. It's like, do I think that there is this other order that is, uh, you know, beyond the material realm that everybody in New York is so fascinated with? Does it manifest through synchronicities? Does it manifest in these different ways? Am I being more and more brought into it, introduced to it? And over time, it just became more and more clear to me that that this had to be the case. And by the end of the process. You know, I'd gone beyond the kind of, even like Walter Benjamin and Carl Jung, and I really was beginning to study like esoteric philosophy and occult thinking, like Rudolf Steiner and Gurdjieff, and um, trying to really understand like from the other side of the, uh, you know, the, the, the rainbow, what, what, what it all looked like, you know, even Aleister Crowley. Um, so yeah, that became a really profound investigation for me. Just if there is this occult reality, how does it work? How is it structured? You know, what does it mean for our future as human beings? And what does it mean that our society has been so, you know, negligent and, and done everything it can to push it away, you know? And what were your answers to all those questions, Jeff? Well, I think that it's, um, you know, I think that there are a lot of prophecies about what's about to happen. I think you know, there's the Hopi prophecies and so on. And, you know, I think that we're in for a very catastrophic time. And we're going to have to, you know, Terrence McKenna wrote about the archaic revival. Um, we're going to have to find a way to take all this kind of information that we've pushed out of our realm and reincorporate it on a higher level. And we're going to be doing that as the kind of support structures that, that you know, have been holding our ship together are going to be collapsing at the same Why time. Why do you think that, in essence, it was pushed away all this time? I mean, you know, these substances have been around mm -hmm. since time immemorial. Why? Basically, in the Western world, is it taboo? Is it forbidden? Is it? What is your thinking on that? I'm um, sure you've thought about yeah, that. Yeah, great length. I mean, one aspect is modern rationalism. I and mean, obviously, there was a need for humanity. It's part of human evolution that we should develop materialist technology. And uh, to do that kind of required a kind of hyper-focusing on the material realm and uh, rejection of these other, of these other possibilities. Um, and I think we've reached, we're reaching the end of that investigation in terms of, you know, it being so narrowly focused. It's, it's just sort of tearing our world apart at this point. And, um, Do you think it's out of balance? Oh, yeah, I mean, completely out of balance. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's... Yeah, but the other thing, I mean... I I mean not that one is wrong and one is right, it's just that it's out of balance in, in the, uh, in like almost the percentages of it. Yeah, I mean, except, except that once you begin to accept that, you know, there are all these other levels, perhaps other incarnations, karma, you know, I think that begins to take on a kind of priority because then you realize that, um, you know, just to be obsessed with the materialist, you know, path 
is not going to do you very good in you know your next five thousand lives or whatever it's going to be. You know, it's a bad <laughs> roll in a dice. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh my God. Um, Jesus, so rooting one life is bad enough, and five thousand would be a. Well, the choices you make right now, I think, are very important. And I feel like one thing I sort of feel is going on right now is that people are making choices. You know, they're kind of uh, determining almost like whether they're going to be able to hang with. Uh, where human evolution is heading, which is going to have to be a kind of reintegration of uh, this lost knowledge into our modern knowledge. It's, uh, you know, ancient wisdom and modern uh, uh, knowledge. And do you see that beginning to happen, that more and more people, maybe even on an underground level or in no. that, you know, media? It's definitely happening. Uh, people are, are very fascinated by shamanism. They're going through all these different esoteric paths, people are really looking. Um, and from the science end, you know, there's this, you know, there's this fact that people are also studying, you know, the field, the sense that there's this like, you know, psi bank or mental field that can have effects on the physical world. I mean, it can't really be denied. I mean, they've done enough scientific studies that, that prove this. And it's just really quite, then if you look at all the quantum physics ideas and what that says about the nature of time and the nature of reality, you know, everything they've, that we've really discovered now that we've gone deeper and deeper into science supports the, um, you know, perennial wisdom, the ancient ideas. It's just a question of people understanding that and putting it together, you know. And do you see, I mean, the way I look at a lot of things is a momentum. Do you see that momentum changing and, you know, the momentum of the disharmony? Yeah, well, right, right now everything seems to be speeding up. I mean, um, you know, we're, you know, this is just, it's like a, uh, I mean, if you, you know, a lot of the psychedelic thinkers are interested in this whole 2012 date as some kind of culmination point. And both Terence McKenna and Jose Arguiles sort of see that, that maybe we've been thinking about time different, uh, in the wrong way, that we have this linear model of time, and time is actually a kind of uh, waveform or a kind of fractal that uh, repeats on different scales and in different ways. And the, a big wave sort of crests and ends in 2012. So at that point, there has to be a kind of switch over through different uh, uh, world conception. And um, part of that process now seems to be a kind of very tight, uh, uh, like almost like fugue state, you know, where we're, the destruction is going faster and faster. The reintegration of these ancient knowledge systems is also going faster and faster. So it's going to be like a flight to the finish, you know, which seems to be, you <laughs> know, the way it's meant to be. An explosive flight to the finish, it seems It seems like, yeah. Yeah, and, I mean, and w when did you decide that you wanted to put this in book form and you know allow other? people? I think as soon as I went to Africa, I knew that I wanted to write a book on the subject, and you know then I was just I, I just still can't believe how lucky I was to write this book, to get it published, to have the experiences that I had. And I feel very grateful to you know the the world for letting this happen. <laughs> and and do you find? I mean, we talked about this a little earlier that there's a certain resistance in in modern day America or Western Definitely. world. Definitely, I mean, to that you know, knowledge being, you know, in bookstores yeah. everywhere or the availability or, or the, talking about the availability. The psychedelic experience, especially, is very very threatening to the underpinnings of the mainstream materialist culture because the psychedelic experience completely decimates the entire worldview of, of the mainstream uh, materialist culture. Therefore, there are all these different uh, methods that, have been, that, are, that are kind of unconscious methods, you know, direct repression, that's not unconscious, but ridicule is another method that, you know, anything psychedelic, you know, in the popular realm becomes a kind of reason for a joke, you know, oh, he did too much bad acid, you know, oh, you know, it's like he's like an acid casualty, you know, so we use all these different methods, lang you know, the, oh, it's just a 60s thing, you know, so we use language as a kind of uh, way of, of denying experience and not and, and we've become a, as, a, as a culture we've become very anti-experiential we've become very interested in virtual te technologies passive pacifying uh, you know yeah, modalities channels. yeah so, so people just expect to be kind of spoon-fed uh, uh, information and experience they don't think that there actually is a necessity in picking yourself up and going to Africa and going to the Amazon and risking yourself and having experiences of these other cultures directly so that you understand, first of all, that um, you know, these people have tremendous wisdom. You know, I mean, the, uh, the shamans in the Am Amazon really struck me as very achieved. You know, there were these guys in their 70s, they're about five feet tall and they were giggling all the time. You know, everything was play for them. They were totally in the present moment. And then they would, did the ceremony where they were just singing all night. And I, uh, taking the ayahuasca, when they sing, they're actually 
uh, using the music to uh, navigate through these different dimensional realms. And they know these realms very, very well. They know exactly what they're doing. And there are certain beings that they're sort of trying to reach. And the sort of crescendo of the ayahuasca night is this, uh, you know, when, when the head shaman was doing this amazing song, um, just like to these other beings, it was like a total interaction was taking place that I felt I was able to witness. I was like there with them. And I realized that um, this is for real, that they are actually interacting with these kind of elemental beings who are kind of involved in all the processes of the natural world. It's like a different order of conscious intelligence. And uh, the shamans actually say that sometimes they, or I, I heard that the tribe says that sometimes when they uh, do these, these rituals all night and get totally into it, at the end of the night, the head shaman from this tribe, the sequoia, would look down in his hand and he would have a, a seed in his hand or a, a new, fl or a new uh, uh, sprig of a plant and he would plant it and it would be a medicinal herb that the tribe would then use. So they were actually singing new plants into being. So this is what they said and I went home to New York and I thought about it for a while and I think it's true. And I think not only are they able to do these kind of negotiations with the natural world, also they're shamans who work with the weather you know, which is pretty interesting for us when you think what's happening to our weather. I think that, you know, we are going to learn how to do this. I think that we are going to learn how to, through shamanism, through psychedelics, through our modern intelligence, when we turn this thing around, we are going to be able to interact with these elemental beings and start putting our world back together. And it's actually going to be a necessary part of the process. To, to harmonize everything that's brought in, been brought into disharmony. Exactly, exactly. And, and do you find that, that, I mean, besides the certain level of resistance on certain levels to the book and the information, that there's a tremendous hunger for that from just almost in a way the masses to know something about... I don't think there's much hunger at the masses. The masses to me seem like uh, nullified, I mean, just totally pacified. I think there are, you know, a small subset of the population is perking up. And, you know, and also it's like as the whole mainstream kind of narrative is becoming more and more like a sort of toxic cartoon, you know, for anybody who has a kind of intelligence, you know, they have to at a certain point just begin to question this. You know, it's like if you read the New York Times every day and that's your vision of reality, there's just like no hope for you. I mean, there's just, there's just nothing left in, the, in that thing to hang on to. Um, so, you know, it's just going to be a very polarizing situation for the next few years. Um, and yet if you go to, for instance, the Burning Man Festival, you can feel that there is this evolution that has taken place in these communities where people have, you know, become much more subtle and much more masterful at dealing with altered states, at um, taking care of each other as a community. And, um, you know, that's part of the process, too. And you found that even in terms of what, what modern man calls illness, that, that these drugs have potential to be healing? Well, for, for shamanism in these traditional societies, healing is like the primary use of these substances. Harmonizing. Oh, actually, the physical, physical healing. Yeah, right. healing. Uh, that, I mean, they call ayahuasca the medicine, and it's really what they'll use for uh, almost anything, you know. Um, and I have heard amazing stories. I mean, I haven't had them, many of them validated about, you know, like ayahuasca being used for cancer and um, having amazing effects, you know. One botanist who I interviewed told me this amazing story about Salvia divinorum, which is a, a psych psychoactive plant used by the Mazatec Indians. She went and stayed with these shamans every year, and she had a heart condition. And the Mazatec family that she stayed with, these shamans said, oh, well, we should do a salvia ceremony for you. They did the ceremony. This is actually Kat Harrison, who was the uh, ex-wife of uh, Terence McKenna, brilliant, brilliant woman, really amazing. But anyway, so she had the salvia ceremony where they prayed all day, then they ate the leaves of the salvia, and the three of them together went to this visionary space. She said it was like this amazing garden, and there was this 10-foot-tall woman in white who was going through the garden, working on the plants, and um, Kat Harrison realized that she and the shaman and the shaman's wife were actually plants in this garden. And um, at a certain point, this woman in white came to them and put her hand through Kat Harrison. She said it felt really, really amazing. And she came out of the kind of visionary trance. And uh, when she went back to the States, she felt better. She went back to the States and her heart condition had disappeared. You know, so she felt like she'd been tended to, like we would tend to a plant in a garden. You know, so I mean, this is an area, I mean, one thing that's so fabulous about thinking and writing about this area is that this is still an incredible mystery. And because the mainstream culture 
couldn't deal with it. The, you know, it breaks all of our aca academic categories. You know, it's still very, very open. It's, it's, it's playful, it's dangerous, it's seductive, it's glamorous, you know, and it's uh, fabulous, you know. So I feel very lucky to have had the opportunity to explore it, you know. And where do you see, like, I mean, would, would you want to do this over and over again, or does it reach a point where for, for me, you've got the right. message or not, or yeah. how would that work, do you think? Uh, Alan Watts once said that, you know, about LSD, that once you got the message, you can hang up the receiver, you know? And for me, I, I don't think, I mean, there are other areas that I now want to explore, and, um, you know, that's, that's something. Like what? Um, all sorts of areas. I, mean, I told you I was, I'm, before that I'm writing this piece for Rolling Stone about Jose Arguiles, who's doing this calendar change movement, and he believes that, you know, modern civilization is is, you know, in such trouble because we have a kind of asynchronous, a kind of wrong relationship to time. And if we go to a different calendar, a lunar calendar, we can actually, um, you know, re-enter a kind of synchronicity zone where we get back our natural telepathy. And you know, I mean, it's very idealistic and optimistic, but. There might be something there, and I've been exploring a lot of alternatives. I went to this thing called the Bioneers Conference, where people are trying to come up with alternative economies, you know, ecological systems, ways of doing bioremediation, um, you know, so sort of trying to uh, get to a different kind of level of, of uh, systemic understanding of, of the human relationship to the world, and uh, through that systemic understanding, finding ways to actually make positive effects, you know. Because our culture seems to be all based on sort of incomplete knowledge uh, and um, not really thinking through the ramifications of our actions, you know. Well, we don't feel connected to a lot of things, so it's going to be a, exactly. You know, exactly. like a short burst of some level of insanity. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I also got very interested in crop circles. I did a piece for Wired. And I mean, if, if psychedelics... Have you been to... England, England and yeah, seen yeah, saw, have you I been in the energy of them? I have been in the energy of them. And, and what I found did you it experience? Quite interesting. <laughs> Tell us. Um, well, you know, really, within like two or three minutes, you feel like I mean, a lot of people just sink to the ground and start sort of spontaneously meditating or crying. I mean, you know, there's a definitely a strong energy field that's created in these things, and you know, it's a very complicated area because there are a lot of mischievous, hoaxing English people who are making them and. Some people think they're all fake, and I, I think that they're probably not all fake, but, it's, but I'm going to need to spend some time there to put the whole story together. You know? and, and, and what do you think about like, what people talk about in terms of ETs? Did you get any experience of that on any of your journeys or any of the, sh the shamanistic well, experiences? The reason, one reason I got so interested in the crop circles is a lot of them are pointing to the same 2012 date in various ways, and there are also a lot of kind of shamanic, <coughs> sacred geometrical patterns kind of recur in the crop circles. And you know, my sense is they're pointing to this 2012 thing being a real event, and then perhaps you know, Star Trek or Star Wars are not that far from the truth. I mean, perhaps I mean, look how fast we've moved with our technology and how fast we've developed. There may be galactic races that are out there that are watching what's happening and are waiting till we get past a certain kind of evolutionary crisis to uh, and introduce out of our themselves. Or something. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, I take that relatively seriously at this point. You know, I'm, I'm a little afraid that I'm just going from wacko to uh, extra to wacko, extra wacko. <laughs> super it's wacko. Like, you know? It's like the cut. <laughs> it's like which part of the cutting edge of the lunatic fringe? But I figure it's fringe. like you know, I'm already you know, I've already broken up my head. I might as well just go for the gusto. You know? Right. Well, that we were talking earlier. I mean, you know, the whole the root of it is we're hurtling through space on a ball. So exactly. Everything is exactly. What's reasonable in that? You exactly. Know? So, yeah, once you have that experience a little, it uh, changes the way you perceive things. So, so. So in your book tours, do, I mean, you find that people are really open to more like going to Africa, more, I mean, is that, is Africa coming in a way to America? Is Africa coming to the West? Is I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if Africa's coming to the West. I mean, but those drugs, those on this thing. A lot of different things are happening simultaneously. I mean, I, I, mean I, I did a panel discussion recently in New York, and this black guy got up, and he talked about how he's into martial arts, and kind of shamanism, 
and there's some kind of new, you know, in Harlem, this new kind of mixture of shamanism and martial arts. I never heard about this before. You know, what globalization is doing, it's destroying the planet at an incredible rate, obviously. On the other hand, it's causing this amazingly fast, you know, uh, exchange of information yeah. and yeah. spiritual traditions are kind of melding and mixing. I mean, it's the amazing. internet's unbelievable It's, it's like unbelievable. That. So, um, you know, uh, Iboga is an interesting story because it's known as ibogaine also, and as ibogaine, it's being used as an experimental treatment for heroin and cocaine addiction. And it's been known about since the 60s as having, or since the 70s really, as having this, this potential. And people have been really having remarkable experiences. Yeah, that's what I meant about some of these things using this yeah. as a you know, real healing method. Yeah. So there are different, I mean, ibogaine is illegal in the States, but there are clinics opening up in, in Latin America and South America, clinics opening up in Canada. And um, it's going to be possible for people to go and have this treatment. It's you know, you can do it and one or two a, times. And this is a psychotropic. It's a, it's a it's ibogaine. It's the psychedelic. It's the synthesized version of what I took in Africa. Uh, you take it as pills. It's less. It doesn't introduce. Oh, by the way, all most of the psychedelics I should tell people induce a lot of nausea and vomiting. I mean, ayahuasca you tend to vomit out all this stuff, and iboga you vomit out a lot, and you know, for the tribes, that's actually a good thing. It's a way of purging. They see that as part of the healing process. And a lot of people, when they take ayahuasca, feel that they Does that get even rid of things for that the are shamans? Like, Do they also, or are they so used to it? That yeah, I mean, some of them get more used to it. I mean, I even got more used to, used to ayahuasca. I don't lose my cookies anymore when I take it. <laughs> um, anyway, so you can go and you can have this ibogaine experience where you, 25 hours, you are there. Often you trip. You see and this is a heroin. Realms. Yeah. Often Detox. you get this very specific psychological, psychoanalytical material is brought up. At the end of this experience, the addicts find that um, they have no craving or interest in the substance they've addic been addicted to. And, they have and this no, is after a long-standing no heroin symptoms. addiction exactly. for like exactly. 15 or 20 exactly. years. And they have and no three days. symptoms. Yeah, three days. And, um, you know, that'll just, that's the, the new place they're in. And what usually happens is they have a few months to begin to kind of change the lifestyle factors that led them into the addiction. Uh, if they can bring themselves to do that, they can really have a new lease on life. Uh, so that's really And are there follow-ups? I mean, do you go back every year or six well, months? Well, you don't have to. A lot of people, I mean, a lot, apparently it's, it's become common to do a second, a second treatment. And, and there's nothing mm -hmm. available like that in the United States at this point for a treatment no, center I mean, like No, all the treatments we have are a, a substitute, a kind of dependency for... One uh, drug for another. Exactly, exactly. And, and so, but there are centers like this in, in Mexico and in... In Canada and in, and in Europe, yeah. So it's ongoing. And so, so that's another place that like yeah. America has prevented healing in a way sure. by its stringent fear or hatred of these kind of substances. Right. I, I don't think it can be stopped now. I mean, ayahuasca is another very interesting situation. There are these different uh, religions that use ayahuasca from Brazil. There's two kind of um, native Christian religions, Santo Dame and Uneo de Vegetalis. Mm -hmm. I think there are more also, but there are law cases going on about both of these religions, you know, they believe that they just have protection to use ayahuasca as a sacrament. The, the uh, religions have official approval in Brazil and in Holland. So they actually have protection, according to the UN. You know, and under the Religious Freedom Act that, that Congress put through, I think in 1993, they have a very good argument that they deserve protection for ayahuasca. And uh, there's a case in New Mexico with Uneo de Vegetales, and they've won the first round with a federal judge. So at the moment, ayahuasca is definitely in a kind of gray area. Um, I, I th understood, because we had other people on the show who mm -hmm. you know, did a lot of, of that kind of journeying. And they said there were two separate substances. One is illegal and one isn't. So it's like when it hits your stomach or something like that. If right, well, that's true. Well, it's very complicated, because the ayahuasca, one of the plants contains DMT. And DMT is one of the most remarkable substances that you can imagine, because if you smoke straight DMT, I mean, Terrence McKenna wrote about it a lot, you enter a completely convincing, uh, you know, sort of cartooniverse. It's like a very, very high speed, completely enveloping other reality. And there seem to be beings there, uh, McKenna called them the hyper self-transforming machine elves or something. You know, there's a lot of action taking place there. You can't quite figure out what's going on, and it's like just as you begin to figure it out, you know, you're out of there again. Mm -hmm. You're back in your reality. Um, so DMT, and, and the other thing about DMT is that it's in your brain. It's probably secreted by the pineal gland, 
um, which also secretes melatonin, which modulates the sleep state. So it's possible, and there's another form of DMT called 5-MeO-DMT, which has very powerful effects, um, also kind of totally reality transformative, but um, less kind of cartooniverse, more kind of like immersion into some kind of all. Um, so you have these substances that are actually produced in your brain, and we've made uh, DMT illegal. I mean, it's sort of interesting, you know, that you could make something that's in your own body and spinal cord and brain illegal, but, um, what they made in the 60s, what they made illegal was synthetic DMT. And what ayahuasca contains is natural DMT from plant sources. So it's still, it's a gray area whether that's, that's possible or not. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's possible that these substances, you know, have something to do with how we dream at night, that there may be like a slight, you know, emanation from them. And there's a book called uh, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. This uh, Dr. Rich, Rick Straussman got uh, FDA approval to do a study of DMT in New Mexico in the early 90s. And his thesis is that DMT is the uh, spirit molecule, that um, it, uh, it appears in fetal development after seven weeks, 49 days. And he thinks that, that when it appears, it's like a, it's like a kind of a conducting mechanism uh, that brings the spirit down into the body. And he th thinks that when you die, the pineal gland releases a flood of DMT which um, courses through your whole brain anatomy and causes the kind of life review that people describe having in your death experiences. Um, and he, he, was bold, his, he developed his theory partially uh, because in Buddhist texts they talk about the soul reincarnating 49 days after death. So he was totally struck by this um, you know, s uh, sy synchronicity of the 49 days. Um, so we don't really know what DMT does, but um, you know, we, we've got it in there, and it's, you know, another area of the mystery which we're going to have to explore. And when a lot of people talk about, like, the psychedelic and the psychedelic experience, they talk about the experience of, people call it love or oneness of God. I mean, d would you give those feelings, did you have those feelings of, of a connectedness of all things? Definitely. I've had it off and on. I mean, um, a few times with LSD, I remember after years ago when, when I first began to sort of reinvestigate, I took LSD and, and just walking around outside in Tompkins Square Park in the East Village one morning and there was trash everywhere and, you know, very old people sitting on park benches and old trees and I just felt like, yeah, like I was, you know, could be part of anything and, um, you know, I definitely think that's that's an aspect of it. And do do I mean? Do you think that's sh part of the shaman's experience in in you know South America, Central America, Africa? That you know that experience of of like the love of the oneness of the connection between us all is has been part of their knowing as they experience. Yeah, it? yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I think that they also just feel very differently about both the supernatural realm and the natural realm than than we do. And I think that part of the you know, 2012 change that's taking place is that our relationship to the natural world is going to shift. And I think that when the relationship to the natural world shifts, the relationship to the spiritual and the supernatural world shift automatically. And, you know, and you, what's the change that's going to happen, do you say? I think we're, you know, just, just an awareness that um, you know, there are all of these other dimensions that are kind of orthogonal to our reality and that we can have experience of them and that they're in fact always kind of inviting us in, in a way. <clears throat> we're not separate from them. We're not, we're not separate from them. We're, we're beings that are undergoing a certain evolution, probably, I, mean, I would think, over many lifetimes. And there are other beings that are undergoing different kinds of evolution. Some of them are helping, you know, helpers to us. Some of them are hinderers. <clears throat> Some of them are tricksters, you know, and, um, you know, to sort of, you know, it's uh, one way to describe it is the imaginal realm. Uh, and we're going to have to claim our own kind of responsibility and, and our own kind of agency in the imaginal realm as well as, in the, as well as in the physical realm. I think one thing that's happened with modern society, it's because we've denied all of this um, information. You know, in Indian societies, they know about, for instance, the trickster. Like the... The uh, coyote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the uh, Indians in northern Mexico have this ritual, the yaqui, where... Um, Every year, they'll unleash the trickster for two weeks. People go around in masks, and these, these gesture masks. They'll cause mischief, you know, cause all sorts of trouble. Then they'll take the masks, and they'll put them in a big bonfire, and they'll get rid of them. So they'll have exercised the, you know, that kind of demonic energy. Since we don't have any kind of exorcism of that demonic energy, it's like it's, it's like gathered everywhere. You know, it's like 
when you get a kind of call from an automated, you know, nightmarish voice or a kind of deal with a bill that takes forever to pay and you have to go through six services. <clears throat> it's kind of like the vengeful trickster is just, uh, you know, totally vibrating around our realm now. You know, so we need to confront it, deal with it, you know, put it in a big bonfire, burn it up, and then move on and, and try something else. You know? And, and do you, did you find that, uh, you know, as you experience more and more in these journeys and these experiences, that uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> that uh, you live more in the moment, that you are more spontaneous, that you are more intuitive? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's something... I mean, I even realized that when I was back in college and I had my first mushroom trips, one of the first amazing things I realized was how I had this kind of intellectual habit of, you know, constantly distancing myself from the moment and never actually just being in the moment. And, um, you know, definitely, you know, I mean, that was one of the really amazing things I took from going to Africa and just seeing the tribes people in their ceremonies. It's like their total interest is the present moment and they're totally in the now. And um, you know, I think we should try to do that too. Definitely, you know. And and what giving yourself up to the synchronistic sort of flow and the of intuitive. reality and the intuitive. And and mm -hmm. the question is, how would you say that we're prevented from doing that? And how do these psychedelics like break mm -hmm. that, break open the head? That's how I always describe. You know, we're such blockheads. I mean, right. when you I saw the day of your book, it's like break open yeah. the head. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We're such blockheads. And then the funny part, as soon as you know, there's a crack in it, we rush up there. With exactly. Like, you know. The, the well, I mean, partially the whole structure. I mean, the whole structure we've created now prevents us because it's like you know, you're thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow, how you're going to pay the bill, how you're going to take care, you know, of this or that. You know, if we go, if we, you know, we're we're constantly in these kind of passive situations. We're on a plane for eight hours. We're you know, in a car for six hours, you know, so we're always restrained, we're always kind of controlled. Well, seemingly our physical form is restrained. I mean, the yeah. rest of us. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to, you know, before there can be any kind of real change, there's going to be kind of structural catastrophe. Be well, in, <laughs> in essence, I mean, a lot, you know, a lot of the spiritual past, I mean, Don Juan and Carlos Castaneda always talked about, you know, er erasing personal history, uh, you know, being in the moment. I mean, you know, uh, well, you know, who yeah, be here now? I mean, it was always yeah. like, how do you, you know, get to the moment? I mean, all the spiritual Yeah, no, Don, Don Juan definitely said, you know, I don't have a history. Like, Carlos Castaneda would try to ask him about where he was from, what his childhood was like. He's like, I don't have a history anymore. I'm just here, you know. <laughs> right. And that's why he could dress up in a suit and be the same. I mean, because, it, you know, that was just, that was as shallow as anything else to him. Yeah. And so... I mean, you see this continuing and, and basically your life coming more and more through your experiences into living in the moment, living in the now, and living in, in that f the freedom of, of that moment. I, I really actually, I mean, I, I feel that what I discovered through the process of writing this book was that I have, you know, I feel like I have some kind of karmic task that, you know, still is going to require a lot of work and a lot of intellectual labor. So, you know, there's some being in the now, but also just some trying to really understand um, what I have to know and how I can present it, how I can move the information. Well, do you along think they're, the they're contradictory? I a mean, little bit. I mean, I think, I think you know, living in the now might be, if I'm one of the lucky ones to survive past 2012, maybe I'll get to live in the now for a while. So you got 10 <laughs> years of this crap left <laughs> of beating your head crap, half the very, time? It's very fascinating. I can't believe the kind of information that I've been introduced to and that I'm the one to try to bring it into the mainstream, I f you know, it's, it's um Have you been given that in, in any visions or by any of these shamans that, you know, they say specifically, Daniel, go go to America and bring... No, I just know that it's the case. You just... Yeah, you just I mean, I, 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 in a sense, you know, I mean, um, uh, in a sense, I feel that it's definitely part of my task, you know. And did you feel that way? I mean, was that like something you felt just since a certain, you know, shamanic trip or a... Or just for a long time? Uh, it was really a culmination. It was a lot of synchronicities also with my different trips and, and world events that were happening. When I went down to the Amazon, you know, when we went down there, the, the presidential election was about to happen. When we came out, the president still hadn't been decided. The morning of September 11th, I was editing a book that I published through Open City by a friend of mine, which is a long poem about corporate globalization 
The uh, book is titled World on Fire. I just opened the book, and I'd st it's about the oil situation, corporate globalization. It's a rant about you know all the whole technosphere, and basically. Then the, the twin towers and then, blowing. And I saw it out my window because I oh, lived in downtown true. Manhattan. So I was well, like, it was like really one synchronicity after another, and I just began to think that, you know, and I, a lot of people have had, you know, I'm not saying that I'm even special, but. You know, there's some task here that I'm being given clues. The show's over. Oh, okay. Amazing. Okay. Good night. God bless you. <laughs>